So much of the recent history of Colombia has been the history of the stranglehold of cocaine trafficking drug cartels on its politics and on its culture. After a series of civil wars in the mid-20th century and a politically unstable compromise between liberals and conservatives to rotate in and out of government, it was under the presidency of Julio Turbe that the Colombian drug cartels began to flourish in the late 1970s. By the 1980s, cocaine was a multi-billion dollar enterprise, pulling over $4 billion into the Colombian economy. Cocaine had become Colombia's most marketable export, a development attributable to two groups, the Cali Cartel, led by Miguel and Gilberto Arajuela, and the Medellin Cartel, headed by Pablo Escobar. 1973 saw the first investment by a drug cartel into Colombian football, with marijuana trafficker Eduardo Enrique Davila buying out recent national champions Union Magdalena in the city of Santa Marta. But cocaine money would soon change the face of Colombian football forever. The Orojuela brothers poured millions into Club America de Cali at the end of the 1970s, despite being fanatical supporters of their local rivals Deportivo. America had been relative unknowns up until the end of this decade. Deportivo, meanwhile, had won five Colombian titles between 1965 and 1974, and in 1978 became the first Colombian side to reach the Copa Libertadores final, losing to the famous Boca Juniors. With Deportivo turning down the Orojuela's advances, the balance of power in Cali soon shifted. Drug money assembled Colombia's best club side. A host of major players came through the door, including Argentine forward Ricardo Gareca from River Plate, Paraguayan star Roberto Cabanas, and Peruvian midfielder Julio Urebi. The football club was the perfect depository for laundered drug money. Cartels could inflate transfer fees and gate receipts to legitimize their earnings, and the clubs themselves were given a taste of success for as long as they allowed cartel cash to flow through the coffers. The Cali Cartel bought themselves five straight Colombian championships, as well as a place in three consecutive Libertadores finals. Rodrigo Lara, the Colombian justice minister who denounced cartel involvement in Colombian football clubs in 1983, was gunned down the year after by hitmen working on behalf of Pablo Escobar. The football fanatical drug kingpin and mass murderer took advantage of the positive PR the sport could bring him. In the early 1980s, the Medellin cartel invested in various football clubs, including Atletico Nacional and Bogota's Millonarios. Football became the proxy by which cartels played out their rivalry. The more successful the team, the richer and more successful the cartel looked. Football gave them public legitimacy and pointed to the all-powerful reach of the cartel owners. Escobar henchman Jose Rodriguez, better known as Gacha, bankrolled Millonarios from 1986 and they stormed their way to two consecutive titles in 87 and 88 thanks to a series of major signings from Argentina. But it was the Escobar name which left the indelible mark on Colombian football. Pablo Escobar saw his local team at Atletico Nacional as an important opportunity to sanitize his public profile. At one point the seventh richest man on the planet, Escobar used his wealth to buy himself public favor portraying himself as a modern-day Robin Hood. He invested the proceeds from his drug empire into social housing, schools, and even football pitches in his native Medellin. With Escobar a key backer, Atletico Nacional won only their fourth Colombian championship in 1981, but after the death of manager Osvaldo Zubelia a year later, America's rise to five consecutive championships saw Nacional fade. Cali had stolen a march on Medellin. It was only through the signing of Colombian team coach and former star player Francisco Machirana in 1987 that Nacional announced Colombian football to the world. The international prestige of Colombian football rose alongside the country's reputation for drug warfare. The two were inextricably connected. Nacional was an extension of Escobar's all-powerful influence on Colombian life, with his millions pushing Nacional all the way to the 1989 Libertadores final, defeating Paraguayan out for Olympia on penalties after two legs. Colombia finally had its first South American champion. And Nacional didn't rely on importing star players from abroad like America or Millonarios. Instead, their methods were more typical of the man whose motto, silver or lead, money or death, had hung over Colombian life for almost two decades. In 1990, Uruguayan referee Daniel Cardellino confessed to having been the subject of death threats in case he failed to favor Nacional in their quarterfinal tie against Vasco de Gama. In November 1989, after Deportivo Medellin failed to get the better of rivals America de Cali in a must-win game, the referee Alvaro Ortega was found murdered and the league championship discontinued. Escobar henchman John Velasquez claimed the murder on the part of the Medellin cartel. Four of the six teams in the title race at that point were under cartel control. 
A generation of players who'd grown up in Escobar's Colombia and played on his pitches qualified for the 1994 World Cup among the favourites. A star-studded spine including Tino Espria, Freddy Rincon and Carlos Valderrama who recorded a thumping 5-0 qualifying victory in Argentina had the Cafeteros daring to dream, but fate was not on Colombia's side. With Higuita banned from the tournament for involvement in a cartel-ordered kidnapping and the spectre of drug warfare at home looming, the Colombian bid soon fell apart. A 3-1 defeat to Hadji's Romania in their opening game sent them into a crunch tie with their American hosts. With Colombia on the brink, the cartels made their most direct interference into the national game, delivering a message on national television that there would be fatal consequences if Nacional midfielder Gabriel Gomez played in the next game. Coach Francisco Maturana saw no choice but to leave him out, and Colombia sank to a 2-1 defeat and an early exit. The face Colombia showed to the world was blemished by the rivalry between cartels back home. Colombia, the USA's chief source of cocaine, brought the drug war right back to America's doorstep. Star defender Andres Escobar had been in the process of finalising a move to European champions AC Milan. Fate tragically intervened, as his own goal helped condemn Colombia to the defeat that would eliminate them from the tournament. Weeks later, he was confronted and killed by a gunman outside a Medellin nightclub shouting goal with each pull of the trigger. Bodyguard Humberto Munoz was eventually sentenced to 45 years in prison and was released after 11 for good behaviour. A court-ordered multi-million peso compensation for Escobar's family was never paid. Despite the cartel's decreased power, their influence on Colombian football can still be felt. Striker Anthony Diavilla dedicated the goal that took Colombia to the 98 World Cup to the leaders of the Cali cartel. Colombian Attorney General Alfonso Valdiveso saw his presidential campaign in tatters after publicly criticising the gesture. Although the end of cartel ownership has returned Colombian football to a more humble level, it's hard to know where the story ends. When Colombia were awarded the 2001 Copa America, Argentina and invitees Canada withdrew, citing death threats. The reconstruction of Colombian football went alongside the reconstruction of Colombia itself. The presidencies of Antonas Mocas and Alvaro Urebi have reinvigorated Colombia's public image, and the nation's football clubs are starting to follow suit. In 2012, Millonarios offered to return the two titles they'd won under cartel ownership. But a year later, home fans unfurled a banner in memory of Gacha's contribution to their success in a game against Atletico Junior. And five of the last ten Colombian championships have been won by the clubs who were once under the control of drug cartels. The shadow of the drug wars and the narco-soccer age still hangs over the country's favourite pastime. This is not just a story of a small group of drug traffickers, this is a story of how a lack of political control provided the perfect soil for cartels to flourish and extend their power to all corners of people's lives. Echoes of the Colombian cartels can still be felt in its society and in its football teams to this day. <laughs>